Good day, YouTube. It's another month, and it's time for plane posting. Today we're covering the first American Delta Wing, and we're starting off with a Coke bottle. You might be asking yourself, what on earth does a bottle of Coke have to do with airplanes? This bottle, or rather, the shape of this bottle, would become very important to our protagonist, the F-102 Delta Dagger. It would be a long road, full of cost overruns, development headaches, and eventually, a functional jet fighter. But first, we have to go back to the climate in which it was developed. Let's rewind the clock to 1949. In 1949, the United States was in the midst of rearming. After the Second World War, most of the world had begun the process of reducing the size of the world military. Most of the world, except the Soviet Union which was continuing to build up its military at a rapid pace. This alarmed the West, and many in the United States were aware that the Soviet Air Force had grown a bit since the war. The Soviets, too, had captured German research data, and they were already using it to develop new jet fighters, and it was assumed jet bombers. In the late 1940s, it was assumed that the USSR had a large number of Tu-4 bombers, essentially an improved copy of the B-29. This aircraft had enough range to reach the US and drop heavy bomb loads on US cities. It was assumed as well that the Soviets had a nuclear program, and the Air Force estimated that they would have operational nuclear bombs sometime in the 1950s. Thus, in 1949, the Ultimate Interceptor was proposed. This would be a supersonic jet able to receive automatic direction to targets from ground radar, engage them with its own fire control radar, and fire guided missiles to defeat the bombers at range. And it was expected to become operational by 1954. This was an ambitious project, and it was to be the first weapons system developed for the Air Force. The idea of a weapons system was to integrate all the components into one cohesive unit they would be designed and procured together and seamlessly integrated, rather than being purchased off the shelf, as had been the case during the Second World War. The Air Force began by contracting Hughes with a fire control radar in 1950, the MC-3. This would fit all the requirements, and the Air Force rightly assumed it would take longer to develop than the airframe. The Soviets weren't sitting still, though. Things were about to be kicked up a notch. In late 1949, the first Soviet atomic bomb was tested, codenamed Joe one in America. This was a couple of years earlier than estimated, and now the Air Force had to reevaluate their assessment of the Soviet threat. They would need that interceptor sooner rather than later. For the airframe, they selected a design by Convair, a unique delta wing shape. A delta wing is the more aggressive version of a swept wing. It tends to have higher performance at supersonic speed, but very poor low speed performance. It required new control surfaces called elevons to take the job of both elevators and ailerons. Convair was confident in their new design, now designated F-102, but already the weapon system concept was showing how cumbersome it could be. Originally, the designers had wanted to use the J-67, a Curtis Wright adaptation of the Bristol Sidley Olympus. Curtis Wright was reporting the new engine wouldn't be ready until 1956. Not to worry, there was also the Westinghouse J-40 in development. But the J-40 turned out to be a massive failure, barely an improvement over other engines of the time. So, they decided to use one of those engines, the J-57 by Pratt & Whitney already in use by many jet fighters of the time. This, too, posed some minor problems. The J-57 produced less thrust than the proposed engine, and was heavier. At first, Convair was sure that the aircraft would still be acceptable as a stopgap. Hughes was also running into trouble, developing their fire control system. The Air Force decided on a new contract. They would pursue some of the designs by other contractors in the interim, but they still wanted that ultimate interceptor, so they settled on a reduced capability version of the F-102 called the F-102A. 
They wanted two prototypes by 1953 and seven initial production aircraft. To replace the fire control system, they purchased an off-the-shelf model from Hughes that was already fully developed. So, now the weapon system, which was supposed to avoid off-the-shelf components, was using two of them. And things were only going to get more complicated from here, as the F-102 had a flaw in its design. In 1951, Richard Whitcomb was working at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics Test Facility in Langley. There, they had a wind tunnel, which they had just modified to produce supersonic airflow. With this wind tunnel, they could now accurately study drag as aircraft approached the speed of sound. Also, a renowned German scientist, Dr. Adolf Busmann, gave a symposium there about supersonic drag. He had found that at air speeds exceeding the speed of sound, air tended to ignore Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle concerns how fluids move. Fluids tend to take the shape of whatever container they are put into. When you move a body through a fluid, like air, they wrap around that body and flow. This is how airfoils are designed to work. At a high enough speed, the air becomes so compressed, it becomes less like a flow and more like a pipe. Dr. Busman described being an aerodynamic designer as being a pipe fitter. Hearing this, Whitcomb had an epiphany. The higher than expected drag he was seeing in the wind tunnels was a result of this compressed air moving over the aircraft. Thus, he couldn't think of the fuselage and the wing as separate. Significant consideration would have to be given to the area where the fuselage meets the wing. In his paper, he described it as maintaining the same cross-sectional area, and thus it became called the area rule. Aircraft designed with this rule in mind tend to have narrow sections near where the wing meets the fuselage. This was an especially large problem for the F-102, and it had a large delta wing that met the fuselage near the rear, so the area increased dramatically as you moved back across the airframe. This was before the paper was published, however, and Convair was busy building the prototypes and early production models. In their mind, it was too late to change the design, so they pressed on. They felt that as long as the engine was powerful enough, they could overcome any drag. They were wrong. The first prototype arrived in October of 1953, but it was destroyed by a fuel line fire during one of the test flights. The second prototype arrived in December. But it was already becoming clear that the area rule was having an impact on the design. The plane experienced extreme buffeting as it approached the speed of sound, and the plane was Mach limited 2.95, i.e. subsonic. Convair went back to the drawing board and redesigned the plane, turning one of the production variants into a new prototype, this one with a pinched fuselage. Described like a coke bottle by the designer, this fuselage tapered right at the base of the wing. With this new design, the aircraft was able to reach the desired speed, and finally, the Air Force had an interceptor. The F-102, however, had come at a cost. Convair had already procured the tools and dyes needed to make the pre-coke bottle version, and now more than half of those tools and dyes, $20 billion worth, that would be $224 billion today, had to be discarded. The F-102A was now done though, and it would begin to enter service from 1955 onward. Convair produced 1,000 F-102As over this period until 1956. Convair was still working on the F-102B, the version that was supposed to be the real Ultimate Interceptor, but that aircraft wouldn't enter service until years later, and with a different designation. The Delta Dagger, as it was known, carried a set of AIM-4 Falcon missiles, as well as a rack of two and three quarter inch rockets designed for air-to-air -air duty. There were proposals to modify the F-102A to carry the Air-2A nuclear rocket, because the weapons bay wasn't large enough, but these plans were rolled into the next version. The F-102 served with US allies as well, including Greece, Turkey. After its active service, 
The F-102 was sent to National Guard units around the country, including in Texas. Former President George W. Bush flew an F-102 during his time in the Texas Air National Guard. The F-102 also deployed to Vietnam, both to intercept North Vietnam's bombers, but also to escort bombers as part of the various linebacker operations. There were also attempts to employ the F-102 to harass supplies moving through neutral Cambodia with their rockets, as well as with the heat-seeking AIM-4 at night. Over the years, the F-102 did prove itself as a capable airframe. Two-seat variants were also used, not only to train Delta Dagger and later Delta Dart pilots, but also to train pilots for other Delta Wing aircraft, such as the B-58. It does also illustrate the Air Force's relentless pursuit of the cutting edge, and the cost they paid to get it. Thanks for watching! That's all for this episode on the F-102. I'll see you in the blue skies. Take care. Next time on Plane Posting.